I gave the card trader 10 months to get his hustling scheme together, but he's still like slipping Jimmy out here. All right, I won't profess any further how useless the guy is. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe just a little bit more, but I do think he has more cards to talk about. So here is the best to get from the card trader part four. He still steals your gems though. I saw it, he's a snake. First off for this installment, uh, we're going over one of the most terrifying monsters in in the game. A complete demon when it comes to one turn kills, and an absolute powerhouse carrying a complete military arsenal over its shoulder. And it looks like this. I know on the surface, Madolce Petting Sasor looks like a complete wash Yoshi Island reject because even those reptilians didn't want to take care of it. It looks that clap. Probably can't even take out Goki Pong. But then you clock. It does this. Matolche is one of those under the radar type decks, but still one of the best sack decks in the game. And petting is literally why. This Pillsbury Doe Girl has three effects. When it's destroyed by an opponent's card and sent to grave, it shuffles itself back into the deck. A motif of the Madolce cards. But then it also has two hard ones per turn effects. If you have no monsters in your grave, you can special summon it from your hand. Then if petting is special summoned this way or any way for that matter, you can special summon an additional Madolce monster from your hand or from your deck, accept another copy of her and reduces its level by one. It locks you into the archetype for the rest of the turn. So this card is like tour guide from the underworld for its own archetype, except better. And it's basically always summoning the level five pudding cess from the deck, who will then become level four. And this gives you the rank four teacher that can then be ranked up into Chocolata mode, who can also special summon from the deck with putting cess as a material, which facilitates another rank four since you still have your normal summon. Maybe another teacher who can protect the archetype on a quick effect by making them a dolce immune to monster effects, or Queen Teramasu who can non-target bounce up to two cards on the field, giving you a big old wall of protected exceed monsters usually with some back row for your turn one, and a board clearing onslaught of non-targeting compulses on turn two, usually with spell and trap removal, making it that aggressive OTK threat. And all of this is accomplished by petting Sessor. Now take a look at this build. That's right, 13 of the 20 cards in this deck are staples. And do you know why? It's because of petting Sessor. And Magdalene, of course. Uh, but that's because Magdalene searches petting Sessor and is the actual one card combo starter. But that's the point. Normally in archetypes, only opening one name and three staples means it's not that great of a hand. Uh, going first with Maggie and let's say MST, Book of Moon, and IDP. That's an amazing turn one hand for Madolce. Now I should note that not every Madolce build is like this. Plenty of them like to add my man Hoop Cake, Messengelato, their field spell, and their spell speed three monster negate. And those things spice it up quite a bit. And those are definitely the builds that I personally prefer. But the more raw version just kind of showcases how ridiculously strong petting system is by herself. I mean, hell, it worked back in August with just five monsters when petting Sasor was limited to one, which it is now completely unlimited. You can just ask my main man, Gyro, who made all three cog lists I just showed, and we don't call him the Sack OTK specialist for nothing. Now, Madolce is a weird deck in terms of obtainability because its core cards are scattered everywhere, but as I said, most of the deck is staples anyway. The biggest issue by far far as Magdalene, who is 100% a necessity, and is in some no one's business mini box from the Stone Age, with no reprint to date. It's so bad I used a dream ticket on her. The Exceed monsters are in Lord of Boral, and Pudding Cess is in Burning Nova, but is at least a one of? So I want to say it's not that bad with it mostly being the card trader and some mini boxes, and then it banks on what staples you have, but it's still annoying. Maggie definitely needs a reprint, but if you just Decide to build this deck, it's at least nice that a three of best card in the deck is obtainable from the sidemen to end them all. It's just what a unit. If someone wanted to say Orchestrated Babel is the strongest field spell in the game, I would not stop them. And don't let the gorgeous heavenly artwork fool you. Your opponent activates this, the field turns into pure hell where you're stuck in whiplash getting cussed out by JK Simmons for the next 90 minutes for your dog shit photos of Spider-Man. Spider the archetypal field 
spell for Orcus that is limited to one, well deserved, and should stay there. But not that it really matters since the card is consistently searchable and has built in recursion, but prevents Orcus from running limit ones and terraforming synergy, so yeah. Pretty simple card, it just turns all of your Orcus effects in the grave into quick effects and does the same thing for Orcus link monsters you control. Also, if it's in the grave except the turn it was sent there, you can pitch a card to add it back to your hand. Its passive effect on the field does nothing for you immediately. It's not like the card searches or boosts attack like other field spells. Instead, Orchestrated Babble just allows a bunch of other strong cards to interact with your opponent on their turn, making this card pretty unique in what it does. You can summon from the deck on their turn with Harp Horror, you can summon from the grave with Symbol Skeleton, which can proc Dengursu's effect to non-destruction, non-target, remove a card from the field, allows Nightmare to send the archetype to the graveyard where you can just proc more effects, and on the field allows Galatea to search the archetypal spells in traps and long Gursu to recover from your banished zone and potentially remove an opponent's monster at the same time. All of this is enabled by Babel. As it, ah, bro, just draw the out. Uh, yeah, and with Dengursu passively protecting your board from destruction, uh, this interaction basically phased MST out for a long time in favor of Cosmic Cyclone, perfectly showcasing the hot potato those two cards do depending on the meta. Now, Cosmic does out this card very well, but run and draw the out ain't really the answer a lot of the time, especially these days in Orcus Twilight era, hooked up on Gandora for life support. But the card is still amazing, Orcus is still amazing, and Babel is essential for what they do. And building Orcus is not a bad idea in my eyes, its future proved to be run alongside countless things and could always lose some of its limitations, and thankfully, most of it is obtainable in Soul Flare Lightning, except Harp Horror. But yeah, Judgment Force is a great box too. And with the current limits on Harp and Nightmare, you wouldn't need more than two copies of Harp Horror anyway, if even that. So once again, it's not bad on this scoundrel for having a very strong archetypal card available in him. We really need more of that, Konami. Make this dude more useful. I also want to say the lore and inspirations as well as artwork for this card are just incredible. And I like how unique and different its effect is too. Now, Odd Eyes Raging Dragon took the proverbial arrow to the knee recently. It's still a kaiju film level looking weapon, but my man's hurting since the skill nerf. Raging Pendulum is still alright and does the service of getting this card out, but we're likely waiting in the back for its next hand holding skill, which, uh, <laughs> It might exist by the time this video is out, who knows. Okay, uh, so. Rank 7 Dark Dragon Exceed Pendulum with a scale 1 that is limited to 1 with 3,000 attack. That's, uh, that's one hell of an Instagram bio, my man. On the field as a monster, if it's Exceed Summoned using an Exceed Monster, it gains two effects. And the skill Raging Pendulum allows you to do that summon. And then, Odd Eyes Weapon Dragon can destroy all other cards on the field and gain two attack for each by detaching a material and also it can attack twice my man comes out to clean and to put nails in coffins he's gonna constantly need support to be able to make this happen but basically just to say the man is the game ender to end all game enders a complete field nuke that can attack twice starting at a threshold of 3,000 is the stuff of nightmares he also sets himself as a scale if he's destroyed where he has a fantastic effect and a scale of one which is also excellent, and allows himself to be pendulum summoned from the face-up extra deck despite not having a level. But that scale effect is to place any pendulum monster from your deck into your other pendulum zone if you don't already have one. That effect is actually insane. However, to set him as a scale is counterintuitive to what the man specializes in. If he hits the field, it's because you're probably gonna win. And I've never seen an Odd Eyes player even ever have him as a scale, because the duel just doesn't go on after that, but still worth noting just because of how good that pendulum effect is. And even though his deck did get nerfed, he's a card worth getting on the potential of future support and skills and also losing his limit one to at least uh, someday maybe be a toolboxy extra deck option for some cards. The Charmers, man, uh, these cards are fun and got a lot better this year. I made it a point a long time ago to get a Prisma copy of each of them because I thought maybe they do something someday. Now, technically, these are the familiar possessed, uh, not the charmers. I, I don't know, there's this whole lore thing about it. But the point is, these cards got a lot of support with a structure deck. 
They're all level 4 spellcaster 1850 beaters with varying attributes and all inflict piercing battle damage. But uh, we don't really care about any of that except maybe the level 4 thing. They also have this very unique distinction about them. Uh, these are some of the only cards, if not the only cards, that can special summon themselves from the deck. Now that is an otherworldly strong effect, uh, but the cost is equally as insane of sending a specifically named card from your hand and a monster of a specific attribute from your field to the grave at the same time, uh, so it's fine. These are literally just names for exceed and link plays and to facilitate their actually really good archetypal spells and traps. Well, uh, I, I guess technically a singular spell and trap really. But Spirit Charmers and Possessed Partnership are great cards, the former searching two cards from the archetype and putting one on the field, and the latter summoning them from the hand or grave and popping a card. The trap can also recur Awakening of the Possessed, an archetype will continue a spell unofficially in the game. It's locked behind a skill that every character has. This card is pretty crazy, prevents the archetype from being destroyed by card effects, boosts their attack, and lets you draw every time you summon one. It's a great card and allows a lot of this to function. Now, that being said, these cats are still not that good by themselves, but Cogworthy, as we've seen, though they're often paired with other things like Mech Knights, Magistus, or even Orcist, but in its purest state, uh, is it affordable? And you know, the entire thing is a structure deck, the card trader, and then it's just staples or whatever engine you run, but multiple copies of a structure deck is a lot of gems without breaking out at least three to six US dollars and that cold hard cash, but the trap and the spell R3 of's in it in its purest state. So depending on how you look at it, it's easy to build, it's somewhat viable, and you can make all of them Prisma. They're just fun cards, a fun deck, but I would not bet on their future potential. Yeah, so this is the part of the video where we start looking down at the bottom of the barrel for scraps. The next two are not good cards, really. <laughs> but we're gonna talk about him anyway just for fun. And again, cleaning this snake out of his viability is easier to do than building magical muskets. That Goki Pawn is a silly card, and I don't mean its effect like I usually do. I just mean it looks derpy as all hell, which, hey, that earns you some respect from Ghost Eagle. Now look, when this dude is destroyed by battle and sent to grave, you can add an insect monster with 1500 or less attack from your deck to your hand. There's a lot of cards like it for different types, and it's situationally worse than Howling Insect that does the same exact thing but summons the insect monster instead. It's just fine as a slow searcher for insect decks, but uh, yeah, it'd likely die to a card effect before battle, and it's not like there's many insects you could immediately benefit off of having in your hand during your opponent's battle phase anyway. Uh, the same cannot be said for Howling Insect that could at least wall your opponent and summon other copies of itself. And that card's free to play too, it's uh, just not in a trader. However, uh, if you're building some stupid gimmicky insect shit for fun, Goki Pawn is there. And he's a cute derpy little shit, so uh... <laughs> So, yeah. Gigantic Castle is one of the only generic level 9 synchros in the game, and it's a complete sideman to Vermilion Dragon Mech. It actually used to be pretty good in Blue Eyes for their mirror match, because they make level 9 synchros easily, and he has this little effect to gain 200 attack and defense for every non-tuner used for his summon at 2900 baseline. For Blue Eyes intensive purposes, this put him at 3100 attack. And what do you know, that's 100 more than Blue Eyes himself and much of the archetype making it a decent situational out in the mirror match of past blue eyes decks keyword being past so yeah i mean that's the man's claim to fame i get caught up in his artwork though it's so damn cool uh but yeah it's, it's kind of a weak card all things considered best case scenario he's a resource consuming 3500 attack beater but hasn't even seen play in blue eyes since september however for all of you fellow necroz enthusiasts he is at least a free-to-play kaleidoscope target that can summon Colossalus and Brio at once. Uh, or if you need filler for Vermilion Dragon Mech in a deck that summons level 9 synchros, then here you go. And, and I guess 3100 attack outs most things in the game, so an adequate synchro staple at best. Lastly, I thought it'd be fun to talk about the most broken card in the trader, and I've never talked about it in the previous three installments. And the reason for that is because this card is banned. It was banned at the time, and a while before it, and always will be banned. A 
card that might actually be the most broken Yu-Gi-Oh card ever conceived. Okay, that's hyperbole. But that grass looks greener is unreal, dude. It seems like a fan-made card. Some newer players may not understand why it's so broken and why it needs to be banned, and assessing its strength and why it can never come back sounds fun to do to me. Even though the card's literally unplayable outside of an unrestricted duel room, in case you're wondering how I'm using it in these replays. So that grass looks greener mills cards from the player's deck until they have an equal amount of cards in their deck as their opponent on a hard ones per turn. In this duel, I'm running a 33 card deck. Baseline of 30 and the fossil warrior skill adds three extra cards. The rest of it is uh, block dragon spam essentially. Uh, the difference in the number of cards in our deck to start this duel is 13 and I open grass and so I mill 13 cards. Through numerous advantage gaining effects, summoning effects, and graveyard setup, I eventually end on a board of a quick effect pop, a monster negate, an immune to destruction 3500 defense monster that also prevents the monster negate from being destroyed by card effects, with four cards in my hand. This is insane. To end on a board like this and to have as many cards in your hand as you started your turn with is ridiculous. And this was accomplished by grass. And now the kicker is, I'm not playing that great of a deck here. It's just a fun gimmick deck I like to play in duel rooms usually without grass. But so many other competent things would take even more advantage of the potential that grass holds. It's a plus five, plus six, plus seven potential type card. It is just way too good to ever come back, especially as we continue to get more graveyard focused things like Orcus would love this Shadal would love this witchcrafter certainly did love it when it was legal and would only love it more now and it couldn't even be a one because if you open that one it just guarantees a win in the right deck I mean hell charge of the light brigade that is run as a mill engine for decks just like this is still limited to two despite the fact it only mills three cards and forces you to run garnets now imagine if it milled 13 and I see no argument for charge being unrestricted either. Uh, so yeah, that was fun. Uh, that's why grass is banned in a nutshell for any players that didn't quite get it. Uh, that's gonna do it for this video and I will see you in my next one. Oh yeah, and uh, personal spoofing is a card that does things for altergeist, so.